What is up, YouTube fam? I have not done something like this in a minute. So I figured I would do this off the cuff live stream and uh, talk about some influence, persuasion, salesmanship, but really talk about some influence and persuasion 101 stuff, right? And this comes from my program, the Code of Influence 2.0. Code of Influence was one of the first trainings that I ever created. And now I've added some video content to it and updated it. I'll put a link in the description if you are interested in checking it out. But what I want to start with is this. I want to start with the fact that we are emotional first and logical second. So people are emotional and triggering multiple mental triggers when it comes to making decisions is how we get to influence and persuade them is by speaking first to their heart and then to their mind. So that's the first thing I want you to understand. People are emotional first and logical second. The second thing is that we are cognitive misers. What does that mean? It means that we have a built-in survival mechanism built into us that is designed to preserve calories, to protect us from burning too many calories. And the fact of the matter is thinking is hard work and thinking burns lots of calories. So most human beings will elect to not think and scrutinize every single situation or scenario that comes their way because they want to preserve their cognitive resources. Because of this, we make rapid decisions using mental shortcuts. And there's different ways that we process information, okay? But what I want you to understand is that we are using mental shortcuts, okay? And what that does is that opens up an opportunity for those who know how to present information in such a way that when a person is using a mental shortcut, you can use that to your advantage. So what I want you to understand is that even though people are emotional first and logical second, logic does have its place, right? And so you want to be able to introduce logic to back up what you're saying once you've got them hooked emotionally, really for no other reason than People want to be able to justify their decisions, their emotional decisions. They want to be able to justify them with logic. So you need to provide that logic. Secondly, is that even though we are all emotional first and logical second, some people are logical dominant. They're skeptics. They're, they scrutinize everything. And so you want to be able to have that logic handy. And you do that with statistics, proof, and analogies. You can also use independent surveys. When you do this, you always want to use current information. You don't want to use case studies that are outdated because it just makes people feel like it's not relevant anymore and it doesn't pack as much of a punch as something that does correlate to today's day and times. And always use, audi uh, always use evidence that your audience can relate to. In other words, if you're going to use an example or an analogy or a proof point to demonstrate a claim that you're making about something, you don't want it to be something that is completely incongruent or counter to what they believe because then you're going to create resistance. So with that being said, I'm now going to share with you the instant persuasion triggers, right? Now, these are triggers that have been researched for years, that have been time-tested and proven to increase compliance rates, increase the amount of times people agree with you, increase the amount of times people say yes to you, okay? So the first one is the obligation reciprocity trigger. And what this tells us is that when someone does something good for us, most civil human beings feel the need to return the favor. They feel the need to reciprocate, 
okay? Next is contrast. And what the contrast trigger tells us is that we make most of our decisions based on comparison. In fact, if you think about it, we probably formulate all of our thoughts, beliefs, values, and behaviors based on comparison, based on contrast. So if you eat a hamburger tonight, how do you decide whether or not you like it? Well, you compare it to the other hamburgers that you've eaten and decide, does it taste better? Does it taste worse? You go out with someone on a date for the first time. How do you decide if you like them? You compare them to people that you've went out with in the past before. What did you like about those people? What did you dislike? Are, th are these people demonstrating similarities to those things, right? So that's another important part of, of this is, is contrast and comparison and learning how to how to harness that, right? And you do that by adding more benefits or rewards or reduce the consequences or risks. You want to create a different frame of reference for people. So in the online marketing world, we always create different frames of reference when it comes to pricing. Because if I just give you the price of an offer, well, now you have nothing to compare it to. You're just going to decide, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to calculate is everything I'm getting worth more than what I'm paying for it? And you'll come to a decision. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if I give you all of that stuff and plus I give you a list price or a value price and then a discount price, well, now you have an extra frame of reference. You can now compare the price that I'm asking you to pay with a higher listed discount price. Okay, so you're able to compare the discounted price to a higher price, and that gives you a different frame of reference. Next is the internal conflict trigger, and this works by leveraging the fact that people tend to act in a manner that is congruent to their beliefs and values. When they don't do that, they experience this thing called cognitive dissonance. Leon Festinger is the guy that figured this out many moons ago and he stated that when our actions conflict with our attitudes or beliefs, we become uncomfortable and we're motivated to change the behavior that is incongruent with our own beliefs, okay? So if you can tie the decision for them to comply with you and do what you're asking to their values and beliefs, then them not complying seems incongruent to them, okay? So there are multiple ways that people try to resolve this internal conflict. One is rationalization. They'll find excuses to justify the loss of balance and why it's acceptable. So for example, let's say that I decide I'm going to go on a low carb diet for the next 30 days. No matter what, I'm going on this diet. I'm going on a keto diet no carbs, I'm going to lose all this weight and I'm going to stick to it. And by day three, I already start eating bread. Okay. So these are the different ways that I can resolve that internal conflict because I believe, and I felt that my values and my beliefs led me to this decision that I was going to go on this low carb diet. Now I deviated from it. So these are the ways that I resolve that. I use rationalization, denial, correction, reframing, separation. So here are the examples. Rationalization. I could say, well, but I didn't eat any carbs for three days and I was feeling lightheaded and woozy. So I, I felt like I needed to put some carbohydrates in my body. I could deny it. I could say, ah, I only had, you know, one piece of bread. It's not going to really make that much of a difference. I could correct it by trying to find evidence that supports the fact that even if I only had one piece of bread during my 30 day keto low carb journey, it's not going to make that much of a difference and impact my weight loss. I could reframe it and I could change the meaning behind it and say like, you know, it's not that big of a deal anyway. And that kind of correlates to the last one, which is separation by saying, you know what? It's not that important to me anyway. Like it's not that big of a deal. This, this, this weight loss thing, I was overthinking it. I was taking it too seriously anyway. Next are commitments. So of all the results that we can achieve by using the internal conflict trigger, the greatest is perhaps getting people to keep whatever commitments they make. 
people generally want to stick to the commitments that they make. Because if they don't, society will perceive them as unreliable and as someone that does not have integrity. So the more of a commitment you can get from somebody, the greater the chances of them complying with you. Written commitments are obviously the best. This is why we have legal contracts and things like that. You can start with minor commitments. So in other words, getting somebody to commit to something smaller, which eventually leads them to something bigger. So if I was trying to sell them like a personal training program where they have to work out with me five days a week, maybe I start with a commitment of two days a week and then gradually get them to that five days a week. And last but not least is making a public commitment. So the more public a commitment is, the more effective this trigger works. This is why sales managers always ask their salespeople to commit to their sales goals in front of the entire team. They want them to make a public commitment. When gaining commitment from other people, try to ensure that these commitments are voluntary. So you don't want to force people to make commitments. You want them to come to the conclusion that they should be making that commitment on their own, that it's beneficial for them in some way. So the three steps to use the internal conflict trigger are gain a commitment, create the conflict, and then offer a solution to resolve the conflict. Next is connection. So connection is the link that exists between others, and it can sometimes be enough to create the emotional need for someone to take action. Rapport is the instant connection between a person and another person or a person and a group of people. Rapport, I always say this, rapport is like money in the bank. The more of it you have, the greater your chances of influencing and persuading other people for a few different reasons. Number one, when you have a lot of rapport with people, they tend to like you. And as we know, if you're a student of influence and persuasion, we know that people are persuaded by those that they like and those that they want to be like, okay? So, or those that they feel are like them, right? Rapport ticks all of those boxes. The other great thing about rapport is that the more rapport you have, I feel like the more you can do to influence and persuade other people, the more you can say. So think about this for a second. Think about you having a debate with a very close friend of yours about something. And like you really want to get your point across. Think about how you carry yourself in that debate versus somebody that you really don't know too well, right? You're always going to hold a little bit back. You're always going to be a little hesitant that you might say something that could possibly offend that person. But you wouldn't do that necessarily with a close friend or a family member because you have that rapport with them. So what you want to do is send off the right communication signals to create that connection with them. And one of the most powerful ways to do that is through body language, mirroring and matching. So in other words, you're just doing what the other person is doing with their body. And some people think that this is obnoxious and they think it's ridiculous. But like the reality is we do this by nature as human beings. And if you don't believe me, what I tell people all the time is if you want to learn about body language, just go watch two people in the park and how they communicate with each other or watch TV with the, with, the, with the volume off, right? But what you will see is that when two people are naturally in rapport, they are gonna naturally mirror each other. So if I'm out having a beer with a buddy of mine and I'm sitting in like this, chances are he's gonna be sitting in like this. It's very unlikely that I'm gonna be sitting in forward like this and he's gonna be back like this unless I introduce or say something that surprises him and it takes him back and he goes, wow, I can't believe that. For the most part, we're gonna be in sync with each other, right? We're just talking about doing it a little bit more deliberately and a little bit more strategically. So the most important beacon of body language is the eyes. The second body part, which is also extremely important, are the hands, right? So some signals that you want to pay close attention to are the hand on the cheek. This means the person's evaluating or considering what you're saying. Head nodding means they're showing genuine interest. Leaning in shows that they're interested, engaged, and eager to learn more. Leaning away, the person is feeling discomfort and resistance. 
fingers in the mouth, person is getting annoyed or impatient, relaxed posture, they're open to what you're saying them. If they're holding tightly to surrounding objects, that means that they are definitely anxious about something and that's something to pay close attention to. Next is this concept from NLP, like I said, mirroring, matching. If you want to learn about NLP, I certainly know a lot about it. I'm not the foremost authority on it. People seem to think I am, but I'm just a guy who read a lot of NLP books. I am not an NLP uh, practitioner or anything like that. But again, mirroring, matching, you can mirror and match voice, mood, emotion, breathing, language, energy levels, things like that. Coming back to connectivity, similarity, we tend to be more compliant or agree with the opinions of people that we feel we are similar to. I remember talking about this case study that was done many moons ago where surveys were mailed out to people and they wanted to see if they could get people to return surveys. They can increase the return rate of the completed surveys if they if the sender's name was similar to the recipient's name. So for example, John Smith would get a letter from John Schmidt, right? And what they found, in, and they did this in huge numbers, is that the more similar the name, the higher the return rate, right? That's that subconscious similarity factor at play. Attraction, the more attracted we are to someone, the more likely we are to comply with them. Humor and respect go a long way. These two things are really wild cards when it comes to making people feel connected to you. I learned at an early age that if I could get people to laugh, if I could, if I could wow them with my sense of humor, I could make tons of friends. Proof. So here comes the logic in this whole situation. We believe that if something worked before, it will probably work again. Right. And so that's why you always want to be able to supply some sort of proof for any claims that you might be making. OK. And the, and the, the norms that we use to base our proof on are explicit norms, which are ultimately written, documented and or spoken rules that are accepted publicly or within a group of people or implicit norms, which are not so explicit, but. They're generally accepted as like the right thing to do. Another kind of proof you can use is social proof, right? If you can show your prospect, client, customer that other people have achieved a similar result to what you are promising, they are more likely to believe your claims. There are a few rules I like to follow. First of all, the bigger the group, the better, meaning the more social proof you have, the more likely it is that people will comply with you. The more people can identify with what the majority of the group is doing, the more likely they are to get involved with it, right? So if you show me a, that 100 people just jumped off the Verrazano Bridge, that doesn't mean I'm going to do it, right? So it has to be something that they can clearly identify with and the clearer, the better, right? The factor that's making it so large is the thing you want to clearly exploit. Next is scarcity. This is influence and persuasion 101, probably one of the more powerful triggers. As something becomes less available, we tend to want it more, right? Very simple and straightforward. So how do we do that? We can restrict freedom which means we can create a situation where your offer is going to be limited or won't be available anymore. We could have limitations like deadlines, limitations of space, numbers, access, or time, or loss potential, right? The potential to lose something. So if I'm selling a crypto offer or something like that, where I might not necessarily have a limit on the amount of people or the offer is limited, but the window of opportunity is limited for me or you to capitalize on my offer. Verbiage. Sometimes it's not what you say to someone, but how you say it that will make an impact on the way your message is perceived. And 
I always like to use the trifecta of power when it comes to any kind of verbal persuasion. That is metaphors, stories, and analogies. And I can get into that in a separate video. I probably have gotten into that in separate videos, but some of the rules are speak simply and clearly. Always speak like you are talking to a third grader. You should always write like you're writing at a third grade level. When you use fancy terms and jargon to try to sound smart, what happens is you take the risk of the person not understanding what you're saying and then mentally checking out. Keep your sentences short and to the point. Use your volume and your tonality accordingly, right? Master articulation, be able to demonstrate your points without using vocal fillers, ums, ahs, ees, ahums. Pay attention to your pace. Are you moving too fast? Are you moving too slow? Especially if you're communicating with somebody else, you want to mirror and match their pace. And then again, always use comparisons. Always create some sort of contrast to create a different frame of reference to help people see things the way you want them to. Another instant trigger is expectations, which tells us that people generally act in a way that other people expect them to. There are various ways to communicate your expectations. Some of them are just assumptions, assumptions that we have about people or other groups of people, embedded commands. Next one is pacing and leading. Again, all of these things set up expectations. Associations. People make mental associations with everything. Again, this is just something we do organically by nature. How do you harness that? The easiest way is to let them take a mental shortcut by creating associations or references with certain things like colors, sounds, endorsements, and music. Commitment. When using this trigger, you need to understand that people usually follow through on commitments, especially when they're public. We talked about this earlier. Regardless of how positive an emotion they may have linked to you, the reality is people will regret their decision to commit if they feel like it wasn't their decision. That's what buyer's remorse is, right? So it's essential to gain commitments from people as soon as possible, but make sure they are genuine commitments. So that brought me back to my first slide. So that was just a, a quick kind of breeze through of what I wanted to talk to you guys about today because I do believe that this stuff is extremely powerful and extremely beneficial in the real world, in the marketing world, in the online selling world. And I want you to be able to be equipped with these things. So if you enjoyed this stream, if you enjoyed this video, give me a like, leave a comment, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And I will put a link down below to the program, The Code of Influence, if you're interested in checking it out. I got a really good deal for you and I got a ton of free bonuses included. I will see you guys soon.